Uh, welcome to this course on Introduction to Kubernetes. I am Nate Zog. Um, this course is de designed to be kind of an intro and it's going to move a little bit fast, but I'll try and uh, explain everything as I go along, so hopefully I won't lose everybody. So here's what we're going to cover. Uh, life before KAS. This K8, K8S is how we sometimes abbreviate Kubernetes. That is K, and then eight letters later, there's eight letters later, there's an S. And apparently I can't do alliterations. <laughs> <clears throat> but we're going to talk about how to get started on your desktop and then uh, show you some tools that are helpful. So I don't know how many developers were it around in the old days. And I say old days kind of in quotes. It wasn't all that long ago. Uh, we were deploying applications to servers. I remember countless times saying, okay, we've got a requisition a server to run our application on, or we need to add this application to an existing server, etc." Of course, there were downsides to that. Even when we get our application loaded on there, 99% of the time, we're using almost no CPU or just a tiny fraction of the memory that we need to have available. Um, it was an administrative nightmare. <clears throat> it was uh, difficult to deploy and then redeploy reliably. And no association between applications. So along came the era of virtual machines. Virtual machines were a vast improvement over the bare metal servers we had before. Uh, we could load up a server a little bit more because we could put multiple virtual machines on one machine. Um, we had better scalability because we can, you know, those virtual machines can move around and better availability for some similar reasons. Um, they had a little bit higher cost because <clears throat> typically you'd get bigger machines uh, to, to put your stuff on and the hypervisors usually aren't free if you're using one of the common ones. Um, and it was still really in a lot of ways no better because we still had... Uh, to deploy our app to this physical machine and if we needed to deploy it to another physical machine well we hope we have the process documented. Along came containers, think like Docker, and things improved for us a lot. <clears throat> There's a lower overhead, a lot less wasted compute resources, <clears throat> no wasted memory and I'll go more into that in a second. Our uh, applications were predictable and easy to deploy and a lot lower maintenance cost. So if we look at this diagram here, <clears throat> so we have the traditional deployment where we have the hardware operating system and then the different apps. We have the virtualized VM deployment and it's a little bit wasteful because we have an operating system here, an operating system here, an operating system here. And while these are nice and uh, separated, unlike before, uh, these libraries here, if they're the same, they also can't be shared. Um, software isolated or container deployment was really kind of a win-win-win. There's just one operating system in the mix. And <clears throat> the great thing is if I'm loading in this app, say .NET Core 5, something like that, .NET 5, and this application also uses .NET 5, some of those libraries that they are shared that are identical can be shared between them on the host memory. Um, and so we have almost no waste between uh, an overhead for, for containerized deployments. However, it's still not the end of the story, uh, but we'll come back to that in a sec. So this is a great infographic, I like it. Um, 65% of orgs have challenges maintaining legacy apps, legacy app in this context is defined as something that's not containerized. 78% um, are using or planning to use Docker for microservices. 71 are gonna plan on containerizing one of their legacy apps, which is kind of difficult. And, you know, I believe this, pers uh, this to be larger, but I think uh, in general microservices are catching on to become the de facto software deployment methodology. So what is Kubernetes? Kubernetes is a platform for managing the containerized workloads and 
Uh, it goes a lot further than just the containers because we have aspects of uh, load balancing, ingress, um, high availability, uh, scalability, self-healing, and secret and configuration management. So there's quite a lot more here than just containers. In fact, Kubernetes, what it isn't is a container. If you're going to use Kubernetes, you have to pick between a list of supported container systems, uh, the most popular being obviously Docker. But you don't have to use Docker. You can use ContainerD directly, and, uh, and a lot of companies are happy doing it that way. Uh, I kind of like the idea of keeping to Docker because it's nice to, you know, and if you're just going to pull something up in development, Docker is really handy for developers. So what else is it? Well, these aren't necessarily part of Kubernetes, but there are typical installations in the ecosystem. So there's also Helm. And a Helm recipe is something we can use to deploy common services. And we're going to do that in one of our demos. There's cluster DNS, or sometimes core DNS. And <clears throat> that's where uh, Kubernetes services keep their DNS records so other services can find them. Uh, there's a web UI dashboard, there's container resource monitoring, container logging, centralized place. All these things are common. If you're using a, a cloud like Azure or AWS, most of these things are kind of just built in. Uh, obviously, the web UI dashboard is like the Azure console or the AWS console, etc. cetera. Um, but if you're going to do a self-hosted cloud, <clears throat> then, yeah, you typically want to add these to your uh, infrastructure. So the interesting thing about Kubernetes is you basically tell it in what's called a deployment what you want your application to eventually look like. You send that to Kubernetes, and so long as the application doesn't look like the spec, it moves it towards that state. And even once it gets there, if a node goes down and, and again, the, the desired state doesn't match the actual state, it takes steps to mitigate that as well. So everything is kind of defined in these deployments. Um, one caveat here is that um, we don't have to start clear up at the level of deployment. You can start a pod directly uh, if you wanted to. You can add a service directly if you wanted to, all independent of creating a deployment. However, uh, deployment is kind of the more DevOps way to do this. So here is the basic moving parts of a Kubernetes cluster. Over here, you see we have this CM, or controller manager. And in the control plane, the controller manager is the guy who calls the shots. The cloud controller manager is an optional component that can work with something like AWS. So for example, <clears throat> if you're automatically provisioning um, block store or something like that, then it would go through this API to get that resource and then use it locally. Etcd, etcd is a key value server and it's only used to store internal state from the API. Uh, the API is going to store some, in, some key value pairs that are important to it, but that's the only thing it's used for. You never touch it directly. Um, the scheduler here is responsible for scheduling workloads on different nodes and also for running scheduled jobs. So a control plane is what uh, we talk to to get our work scheduled, but they are eventually scheduled on a node. Typically, there is a node on the control plane as well, but it has two other additional pieces to it. Those pieces are Kubelet. Kubelet <coughs> excuse me, is responsible for um, coordinating with the, the control plane uh, about what work is going to be scheduled here. It takes care of things like pulling whatever images it needs in order to do its job. All that happens in Kubelet. Uh, Kubernetes proxy here, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, the networking side of the, all of this. And anything where we're doing networking, that's what K proxy is for or Kubernetes proxy is for. What's not pictured here and also has to be here is some sort of container uh, controller. 
typically Docker uh, is also in a node. And between all of these, these are all of the different parts of a Kubernetes cluster. So the most primitive basic part of Kubernetes is something called a pod. And a pod is a group of one or more containers. So think of like a pod of dolphins. That's how I like to remember it. Um, <clears throat> the containers in the pod can share resources. And the pods are most atomic unit of deployment. So in, in this graphic here, we've got, you know, a single container in a single pod. In this, we have two containers, one a database and one probably an application. So there's two containers in this pod, three containers in this pod, and so on and so forth. Actually, those are volumes, sorry. I was gonna say, I don't think database was right. <laughs> so yeah, this one has a, uh, an app, containerized app and a volume. This one is sharing that volume with between two apps. Everything inside the circle is, is you know, open to each other. <clears throat> and you'll notice that each of these have an IP address. So each pod has an IP address. So a node, if you'll remember, is a place where these containers or pods can be scheduled onto. So it's a worker machine. It's controlled completely by the controller plane. You can't give a node a command directly. Kubla is the process, as we talked about, that's responsible for communicating with the control plane. And then <clears throat> different nodes can have what's called a, t a different taint. And basically, it's a set of requirements about what is able to run here. One example of that is Windows containers. Windows containers are specific taint, so you're not going to put uh, Linux containerized loads on a Windows container server on a Windows node. So there's typically a, a taint there for Windows containers. You can also use it to say, we don't want to schedule any new work on this node. So we can use it to basically empty out the, uh, the pods inside of it in an organized way. And then we could you know, shut down and reboot that node or whatever else we need for maintenance. A service is an object in Kubernetes that allows you to basically uh, encapsulate a set of pods it adds an abstraction because then we have a way of looking up those pods. Uh, remember my comments on core DNS and Kubernetes DNS before. Um, it's defined in YAML or JSON. I like the idea of JSON more than YAML, but good luck finding any examples. So, <laughs> um, And then basically the services also tie into ingress somewhat. So. They allow applications to receive traffic. So there's a few different kinds of uh, networking setup we can have with uh, services. The default and most basic is called cluster IP. And it just makes the service reachable within a cluster. On top of that, which is actually built on cluster IP, is the notion of node port. Basically, it's exposing a port on some node because each node has its own IP address and we want to map it to a port. And that's again, a super set of cluster IP. Load balancer is going to allow us to load, to balance between several of our different pods. And that's also built on node port, which is built on cluster IP. And then finally there's external name, which is a kind of a newer feature isn't typical or isn't really well supported yet, but uh, is a newer feature that kind of can look at, look at things like what URLs come in and load balance off of that. Okay, so next concept here is called a replica set. Um, the basic definition for replica set is how many of what pods need to be running. So. Here we show we have a replica set of, there's four, and you can even say in your replica set, it has to be on two different nodes or you know whatever else, but a replica set is just defining how many of the same container we need to run. The next thing we need to discuss is labels and selectors. 
So labels allow different objects in Kubernetes to reference other objects as either dependencies or whatever else. They're simply key value pairs and uh, typically you have to come up with your own scheme. So for example, one typical one is environment. So you would say environment, dev, or test, or prod. Other common labels are app. So you can see in this example, <clears throat> you have app A and app B. And if we say uh, we want to work with you know, any label with app equals A, then it, it's a powerful way of, for us to, to target our commands to just a part of our application. Um, app version is another common label. Okay, so now we're up to deployments. So a deployment, as I kind of mentioned before, is a declarative way of defining what your application should look like. It goes into details de defining services and pods and replica sets and volume mounts and everything else that you need in order for that to run. We're describing a desired state and it's the deployment controller's job to take whatever the actual state is and transform it to whatever the desired state is. And you can even change your deployments in, in the case of updates. What we could do is we could basically say, okay, well, we're using label with the tag of version one. Now we want you to use an image with the label of, of the tag of version two instead. And so what we have showing here is service. So these pods constitute a single service. A rolling update is going to create new services with the updated apps. Still going to leave the old ones alone. Once this is healthy, it's going to create more of them on more of the nodes. Once that's healthy, all the rest of the nodes can be updated. So that's kind of the rolling update deployment process. Uh, persistent volumes or PVs, they can be either static or dynamic. Um, <clears throat> I think typically most of them end up being dynamic. Um, this allows you to say, let's say I'm creating a web app and I know I need at least one gig of space so I can ask for one gig of space. The uh, persistent volume claim is basically saying I want one gig of space. And this uh, claim is satisfied by finding a volume or creating a new volume of the requisite size. These volumes are also uh, enduring. So even if I delete my app and delete my deployment, those volumes remain. And this was a design decision that they chose because they didn't want you to accidentally lose data. So this can bite you as well if you don't understand that those volumes stick around and you think you deleting the deployment is going to um, actually purge all of the stuff about an application. You create it again and, and that data is still there messing you up. So PVs have a lot of different ways that they're supported through different kinds of interfaces. So these are just the current supported ones out of the box, but there's an interface, actually the CSI, Container Storage Interface, allows this to be expanded further. And these volumes can have two different modes. We can either be a file system or block. In a file system, we're basically saying, here's a file system in order or for you to save your data to. In a block store, they're going to create partitions and things inside of there and then it's going to manage its own file system. Okay, and then after, after that, we need to understand kind of the access modes. So we have read, write once, or RWO is the shorthand for it. it. Means the volume can be mounted and read, write, but only by a single node. Read only many, or ROX, the volume can be mounted as read only by many nodes. Read write many or RWX, the volume can be mounted as read write by many nodes, and read write once pod. And basically it means <clears throat> it's like the uh, read only many, but one of them gets to read write. 
This is also a newer feature, so it may not be supported in all Kubernetes. So let's talk about a second about a, a stateless application. So by default, when I create a deployment and we specify a replica set and say we say we want three replicas across two nodes or something like that, then what we need uh, or what we're going to get by default is a stateless application. And stateless is the best because it allows Kubernetes to work faster to uh, move the nodes around and have a little bit less baggage to follow them. And, you know, it's typically, you're typically hosting like a website and stuff on here. Those really should be stateless, right? It shouldn't matter if I started at service A and ended on service, you know, copy two. But we also have what's called stateful replica sets. So we use a stateful replica set if we need a stable network identifier, e.g. Uh, we will always want the same IP address provisioned every time. Uh, we need stable and persistent storage. We need ordered and graceful development of scaling, deployment and scaling, excuse me. And we need uh, automated rolling updates. So there's still quite a, use, a lot of use cases for state for replica sets. A canonical example would be if I pop open a MySQL database on here or MariaDB, then um, I would probably need a stateful replica set in order for this to work correctly. Now, it's there's no guarantee that the database is going to be able to run in a configuration where multiple nodes are active, but at least if we tell it we just want one copy on one of the nodes, then it can be something that we can use in our application. So here's some of the limitations on the replica sets. One of the most unusual one, at least maybe I haven't figured out why yet, is a stateful set requires a headless service. A headless service is defined as, uh, we'll see in the next slide, um, a service that has no network connections for it. No, no network connection for the cluster IP anyway. So in order to have a stateful replica set, you have to have at least one headless service that these kind of uh, use to kind of nest under. And again, I'm, this is just kind of the technical definition, but it's a headless service is something that where we say none for the cluster IP, and then it's headless. Next thing I wanna to touch on real quick here is the file format. The file format is basically just a format for specifying an object. There's always this API version at the top, there's always a kind, and we're gonna tell it what kind of object we're doing. There's always this metadata tag, there's the namespace and name and any other metadata labels we wanna set in here. There's also always a spec section. <clears throat> the spec section has a selector which again, the selectors are a way for us to um, tie in other objects based off of their labels. And then beyond, below that is just the properties are specific to whatever object type that you've specified. In addition to that, there's a syntax where you put these three dashes and then you can put another object right below it. And it works well with that. Okay, so now it's time for a demo. So let me get that popped open. Okay, so I'm going to show you one sec, one thing real quick. Um, I've got Docker Desktop installed. It's just a regular Windows machine. And so long as I have Linux containers selected, I have the option to enable Kubernetes. So you can see Docker is running, you can see Kubernetes is running. So after that's runs, or after it's enabled, I should then have the ability to do kube ctl and then version. This tells us we have kube control installed and it looks like it's up and okay. <clears throat> if we wanna see if it's healthy, we can do kube nodes. Sorry, 
get to nodes. And one thing I'm also going to point out, and it's just the little things in life, I can say get node or get nodes. I can pluralize it or singularize it and it'll still work. Isn't that great? <laughs> but yeah, we can see we have my Docker desktop node status is ready. It's got control plane and master and it's been around for a while. <laughs> okay, so the first thing we want to do is play around with a deployment. So I'm going to copy this over here and then paste it and explain it. So kube control create, we're going to create an object. Object type we're going to create is deployment. We're going to name it Kubernetes Bootcamp. We're going to tell it the image that we want is this right here. And what that will do is it will create a deployment. So now if we say get deployments, there we are, Kubernetes Bootcamp. If we do git, oops, kube, git pods, then we'll see we've got this pod running. <clears throat> now the pod is named a little bit differently. The reason they do this is because <clears throat> when they run on different nodes, they need different names. And so what the deployment's named is kind of going to be part of that name, but it's going to have a unique part of it as well. It's kind of generated based off of its hash. And then if we want to see really some details about that pot part, we can say describe. Now I didn't have to put which pod I wanted to describe in here because I only have the one. So it's going to show me actually all of them, but I'm only going to get the one because I only have the one. But we can see that here we go. Here's the image that we told it to use. We can see that it's running. We can look over here in its events. We can see that it was created and started, pulled, scheduled, all, all the way back to the beginning. Uh, how long ago since this, all, this has all happened. And then later there's other information here that is more useful that we'll go, go through. Um, we can also get to the logs just like we did with Docker. So for example, and then I need the name of this pod. One thing I don't like is that in Docker, you could just specify part of a name, but on Kubernetes, you have to have the whole pod name. So you find yourself doing a lot of copy and paste. And here we go. These are the Docker logs. This, we'd get the same thing if we do Docker PS. <clears throat> And we found this guy here. Um, 76. So if we did Docker logs 76, exact same thing. Um, but you know, if we're deploying it in Kubernetes, we want to kind of leave Docker alone because we want Kubernetes to manage this, right? We don't want to sneak anything underneath them uh, and cause problems. So we can even do this. So we can say exec, and then our pod name, and then there's two dashes, and then this is what we're going to uh, run. So in this case, I'm going to just do env. <clears throat> so it's going to show me all the environment variables on that pod. And I can even do the like we did with Docker exec IT, we can do an IT, which stands for interactive terminal, and say bash. And here I have a bash, sh uh, sh here I have a bash shell inside of our pod. Okay, so uh, that's all well and good, but our initial just based the way that we did the deployment didn't contain any services. So it's really kind of difficult for us to find or route to this, this pod because we haven't defined it as a, a service. So we're going to run a command here and I'm just going to copy it because it's kind of long. Now if I run this command here, then it's going to expose our deployment 
using the node port uh, style service and we're going to expose it on port 8080. So now if I do Well, shouldn't have been. Well, okay, let's do a little bit of live troubleshooting here. Ah, I'm, okay. <clears throat> the reason that didn't work is I want this IP, or this port number. There we go. And this is coming from our container and it's kind of cool because it tells us, uh, you know, hello world. It tells us what pod it's running in and what version. So next what we can do if we look at this, uh, the service, describe this object as services slash Kubernetes. <clears throat> uh, and one thing to note is uh, Describe is just going to describe an object. So the convention is there's an object type and then a slash and then the object name. So this is going to tell us all about this service, the, the one we just created above. As you can see on the uh, container side, we're exposing port 8080. And then on node port, it's going to be port 32400. We could also do... Uh, we could also get this off of that. So if we do this guy, oh, except for my network isn't going to work that way. But it's also is exposed to all the other anything in the pod as, at that IP address. So um, let's keep going. So next thing I want to do is show you how to add a label. So I'm going to do label pod. And let me grab that pod name. Let me say version equals v1. So let's then describe our pod. So kube control describe pod name. There we go. Sorry about that. <clears throat> So this is going to tell us all about our pod. So the name, <clears throat> what namespace it it's in. Since we didn't specify namespace, it's always the default namespace. You can see we added that tag right here. It, we can also see that it had already the tag of app. So the app is Kubernetes Bootcamp. The hash is that, no, the, uh, sorry, the hash is this, which you can see corresponds with the name here. And once we've done that, we should be able to now delete or any of these other commands based off of their tag. So I'm not going to actually run this because I want to keep this uh, service around for a little bit longer. But the L means by label. So we're going to select based off a of label and then app equals Kubernetes Bootcamp, which is right here. So that allows us to do some pretty powerful stuff with how we uh, use the command prompt here, but only if we've got a good mechanism to, uh, to only if we have a good scheme for uh, organizing our deployments. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is I want to uh, scale up this deployment. So I'm going to get deployments. You can see one of one is ready. There's one up to date, one available, 11 minutes old. 
And if I do RS, get RS, which stands for replica set, we can see the replica set for this. We can see the desired count is one, the current is one, and the ready is one. If we want to then scale up the number of replicas, we can do that with this command here. And it's the kube control scale. And we're telling it what deployment to scale. And we're saying that we want the replica count to be four. If I real quickly do kube get pods, Oh, it beat me, <laughs> but you know, it added three others. So you can see this one's 12 minutes old. The rest of these are six seconds old. Um, now, if I do our curl command here, you can see there's H M Z M H H M Z M H. So it's, this is the one it ran on. <clears throat> Oh wait, I haven't set this to load balance yet. I don't know why I'm trying to do this yet. <laughs> oh well. Okay. But here we can see all of our pods running for that replica set. If we want to change it back down, we can do that as well that same command I used before, um, this one, this time, instead of four, I'm going to move it to two. If I do the get pods real quick, you'll see that two of the pods are terminating. Okay, so next thing I want to do is I want to update the image running in these pods. So the first thing I want to do is I, I'm going to describe the pods. Inside the pods, you'll see uh, that we have this bootcamp v1 image. We're going to change that. So the way we're going to do that is with this command here. <clears throat> we're going to set the image for this deployment. And it's going to be version two. So now when we run this, it's going to do that apply apply that change. Now if we real quickly do uh, get pods wide, you can see it's terminated all the old ones and created new ones. So there we go. Those two terminated because they were running the old. See, it even did the rolling update. It did one. Made sure that one was probably healthy than did the other one. In fact, you can see based off of their age, that's that's how it happened. And so now if we do, oops, coop control describe pods. Coop control describe pods. And now we go to that same place, we can see the image has changed. Even shows uh, in the history how this has all gone down. Started container, got the image, it was already here, and then assigned it. So let's do this again. I'm gonna grab that same command, but this time I'm going to Tell it I want version 10. Now, version 10 does not exist. So what's gonna happen? Well, if we describe our pods, sorry, not describe it, if we uh, get our pods, <clears throat> we can see that there's one of these that is trying to create a new replica, but it's in this image pull back off. What that means is there was an error pulling that image and until we figure out what to do, it's stuck. How do we know what to do? Well, if we go back to describe pods, we move up a little bit here. Uh, 
し。Two. All right, here we go. We can see failed to pull image, error image pull fail. So now what we need to do is actually revert that deployment. So there's a really great command to do just that. It's this guy here. And basically the rollout undo command is going to put this into the last known good state. So uh, it, when we're done with this, it should show version two because that was the last time we were in a good state. And if we do get pods, you'll see that the one that was uh, airing out over here is now terminating and the other two are healthy. We do a describe pods and we can see we're back to version two. All right, any questions so far? Nope. Okay, so those, that's kind of the basics of Kubernetes. The next thing I want to show is Helm. So Helm is interesting. You know if you have it installed, if you can do that command. Um, Helm is a way for us to take really commonly deployed applications and create kind of an automated script to deploy those to uh, our uh, Kubernetes environment. So uh, if I do helm repo list, we can see I've got several repos in here for uh, different things. And I can do helm repo search, for example. Ooh. And that's going to return to me anything that has Jenkins in its name or description. And uh, we're going to install Jenkins real quick. So let me grab this little script here. We're going to say Helm install. And I want this version of Jenkins because it's the highest app version I can get. And I want it to create the namespace. The namespace I want it to be in is called Jenkins. Uh, we're going to say the name template. So this is going to be Jenkins whatever. Uh, we can do this or we can tell it to auto name. And I kind of like specifying the name. So that's how we're going to do it. So boom, we have Jenkins installed. Before we can really uh, get into it though, <clears throat> we have to get the password. So this guy right here is going to tell me what my password is. Um, that's odd. It didn't apply. Oh, it's not a deployment. Huh. Get. There it is, Jenkins. Okay. Okay, it must not have quite been up yet. And boom, here's my admin password. So I can grab that guy. <clears throat> and the other thing it told me I needed to do is expose it like so. Okay, so let me grab my password again here. <clears throat> Open up a browser. Ooh. And boom, we have Jenkins. Admin, here's the password. Sign in. And create a job.
and yada 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 so yeah Jenkins and it's that easy for everything and there's quite a lot in there so if I do um, helm search repo nothing it shows me everything I have in here and I've got a ton of stuff in here MariaDB, Magento, MySQL, GenX. Yeah, all kinds of stuff that are in here. <clears throat> now, Helm is kind of an abstraction a little bit above uh, Kubernetes. So if, if I do Helm list, it's going to show me all of my, <clears throat> excuse me, all my deployed applications in the default namespace. However, since I didn't put this in default namespace, I either need to add slash capital A or dash capital A to say I want all deployments, or I have to specify namespace. And from here, I can uninstall. So, Here we go, Helm uninstall, the namespace is Jenkins, and the deployment name is Jenkins. Okay, let's just make sure it's gone. So if we go to pods minus A, oh, sorry, git pods, <clears throat> Jenkins one is gone. Now what about um, persisted volumes? Ah, you can see we've got some persisted volumes here. Actually, one of these isn't Jenkins though. Jenkins doesn't use persisted volumes. So, it's interesting. That version of Jenkins doesn't anyway. Uh, and then also, get services. Okay, so let's jump back to the slides for a second here. Before you do, yeah. If Jenkins did have a uh, volume, would it show up oh, uh, up there? Yeah. The PV is persisted volume, and I said A, so show me all the namespaces. And um, yeah, it's, it's just not here. This is just some other crap I did so with something else I just need to clean up. So the way I'd take care of that is I'd say, um, Delete will delete any kind of object, right? And in this case, it's a persisted volume. And I have to give it its whole name. And that's how you delete it. Okay. Okay. All right. So. <clears throat> There's a couple of really cool tools to help you in your process. One of the ones I think is kind of most interesting is Kubernetes Compose. Compose will take a Docker Compose file and translate it into a Kubernetes deployment. That's pretty neat because uh, A, I feel like the Docker Compose file format's a lot easier to follow. And B, it does a pretty good job. It's not filling in all the blanks, of course, because it, Docker itself, Docker Compose itself doesn't know anything about replica sets. It doesn't know a lot about a lot of different things, but it can make sure you get the right image. It can make sure you get the right volumes mounted. It can make sure the right environment variables are set and those kinds of things. Um, very handy tool. The other handy tool is the Kubernetes dashboard. <clears throat> so this is just an easy point click way to manage some of the stuff. Of course, you need to know how to do it in the command line, and of course, the command line is better in cases. As you've seen, we can target commands based off of different tags that are on things and things like that. So it's really an awesome idea uh, to use the command prompt when, when necessary, but it's also nice 
sometimes just be able to come in here and say, hey, I want to delete this pod, you know, or I want to see what pods are running. Oh, that one's using a lot of CPU cores, whatever. The next one is Lens, and I'll show this off in my next demo. But Lens is a, um, <clears throat> it's a, thick client application that connects to a Kubernetes cluster and lets you manage it similar to the way the dashboard does, but with a little bit more functionality. <clears throat> this is another good one, and I'll, I'll show this off in my next demo as well, but NetData. This is simply a Docker, um, a Docker container with host access, of course, that's going to report on the status of the entire node so it's very helpful for understanding what kind of stress your node's on. And lastly, there's a, a neat little tool called Rancher. So <clears throat> Rancher allows you to, with just a couple lines of Docker, compo not Docker Compose, with a couple lines of Docker run code, it will pull the image for Rancher, set up Kubernetes cluster, set up all the things you need in it, create a deployment for its dashboard. And then inside of here, it gives you all kinds of neat plugins as well. Uh, for example, it's got a really great uh, persisted volume manager that is distributed. I, I think a lot of it, it's a really cool tool. Uh, if you're gonna do a kind of a private cloud, I think you should have pretty much all those tools. So real quick, let's do a demo of VS Code. So VS Code is one of your go-to tools as well. <clears throat> and Lens. So we'll look at Lens first. Okay. So here's Lens. And on the left here is all the clusters I am connected to. This is my local one and the only one I'm connected to currently. To connect a cluster, you have to get the uh, connection command Fortunately, it gives you a nice little uh, tutorial on how to get that. But uh, once you get in the cluster, this is kind of neat because you can see, you know, we've got two pods, one deployment, how many stateful sets, how many replica sets, what are the replica sets? Oh, okay, here's three. Um, the cron jobs that are running aren't any, but uh, the networking. So we can look at all the services. We can do some task with these services. Uh, we can look at the ingress, network policies. We can look at the persistent volume claims. And I can delete all of them. And then we can look at the persistent volumes who are now empty because I deleted all the claims. <laughs> we can look at the storage classes. Right now we have host path. Host path only works if you've got a single node, it's not scalable. So you need to add other kinds in here. Notice I can't actually add a different storage class here. You'd have to do this via command line. So this is only a tool that gets you kind of halfway there. Uh, it shows us all the namespaces in here. I want to get rid of the Jenkins namespace, so there we go. Uh, it shows us all the charts for Helm. So if I wanted to look for um, there we go, I can click on it. I can say install. It's going to show me the Helm chart ahead of time. So I know what it's gonna do. And then we say, okay, it looks good. Just let it go in the default namespace, install. And now it shows up in the Helm releases. That quickly, we've got a database up. And again, here's all of the, the parameters. So the Helm charts are going to kind of create <coughs> a deployment and deployment's going to be very long, <laughs> but that's just kind of how it works. Anyway, so that's Lens. Next, let's show VS Code. 
So if you've got all the plugins, so we'll put So there's the kind of the main Kubernetes plugin. This allows you to do tasks in Kubernetes from within here. You can see that it's got this new tab in here. You can see our cluster and our Helm repos. And there's a couple of snippet ones that I kind of think is pretty neat. But this one is um, snippets. And then let's see, well, there's one more. Oh yeah, Kubernetes templates. And this one's maybe even better. But these templates, uh, you start just with KS and you can do all these others. So if I do that here, K8S. So if I want to create a secret, for example, because I want to store my password in here, I can say the password. you'd probably want to follow convention here like that but anyway um, other thing I will show you is that net data running on an actual cluster so if Phil you'll edit out that URL that'll be great <laughs> But this is fantastic. It shows me over the last several minutes what the CPU usage was. If I uh, strobe over any of this, it will show me what was going on here. So we can see I have 45 megabytes of, per second of disk right here. Right here I had 62. Over here I've got quite a lot of read, 23. Um, but just look at these live stats. The number of running processes, IRQs and interrupts, the status of your entropy heap, uptime, the individual CPU utilization, networking statistics, memory statistics, page fault statistics, disk statistics, And you'll notice I'm only at just a tiny fraction of the way down the progress bar. <laughs> it just keeps going and going. It just keeps going and going and going, yes. All of it, just such awesome data. Look, I mean, how many packets I'm sending out. <laughs> so cool. Yeah, I don't know how, how much further I should scroll, but... It, it's got no end of, of in sight here. But it's a great way of monitoring your, your stuff. It can even provide some warnings when certain things hit certain thresholds. All right, well, I think that's the end of my demo. Are there any questions? Did you install this uh, my net data through Helm and Tiller? No, uh, this I installed uh, just directly as a Docker run. Okay. It requires privileged execution, so I don't think you can even do it through Kubernetes. Kubernetes, I don't think, supports allowing that. So, as you know, privileged mode basically means it can have full access to the server. You're basically turning isolation off, but you're still running an image, which is kind of cool. So that's why we can do all these cool things like have Rancher automatically set up a Kubernetes cluster on the machine it's on. Even though I pulled it as a Docker container and running it inside a Docker, it still has access to that machine that can set up a cluster. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah, if you're curious about the command for that, I do have that around here. 
It's no, I don't have it on here. Never mind. That's okay. I know a guy who can install it for me. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everybody for your time. Hopefully, this was useful as an introduction. Uh, maybe, perhaps later on, we can look at doing a follow-on. Uh, obviously, we didn't touch on everything. In fact, we've only touched on a small percentage of of what the capabilities of this system are. And so, yeah, it might be worth worthwhile to to do this again. Cool. Thanks, Nate. Thank you.